Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free true crime to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. This is a Shares for Beginners quick tip. Essential lessons. Questions answered. The first episode of this podcast was released in February 2019, and my first guest was a financial advisor named Rob Gilmore. I couldn't have asked for a finer first guest. He's highly experienced in advice as well as having a background in markets in Australia and London. This quick tip is taken from that very first episode, and it kind of shows where my head was at the time. I was still thinking of the share market as a place to get rich quick and hadn't learnt about the long-term compounding nature of the game. It's my main goal with the podcast, to make sure that listeners don't make the same stupid mistakes that I made. Here's a little segment about ways that you can invest and the ones to be very, very careful of. I guess there's a number of different ways to invest in shares. You can access shares through a managed fund um, and that's where you're effectively outsourcing the stock picking and employing the expertise of a, of a manager. And that can be really useful to say access shares overseas. So people talk to me about investing in Asia. Well, I really wouldn't know where to start in the Chinese stock market, but I know managers that are pretty good at it. So there's managed funds and, and using those is a great way to get access to a specific type of strategy or, or, or segment of the the global share market. Can you explain to me in a managed fund just in a bit more detail about how it well, works? Well, managed fund, you, you give your money to a fund manager. Uh, the fund manager uh, ultimately uh, invests that money in a portfolio of shares and there is a fee that that fund manager charges as a result of that. So hopefully you choose a manager that is going to perform well for you over the long term and that's known as active management. So they're actively managing a portfolio to ultimately deliver excess returns or beat their benchmark, but not all of them do. And how do you, how do you buy a managed fund? Uh, you can go to a fund manager directly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can buy managed funds these days on the ASX through, um, through what's called uh, M funds, uh, which is a very easy way to, to access managed funds. A lot of managed funds these days are also traded on the ASX in the form of um, – Exchange traded managed funds, so e- ETFs. Yeah, they're so like ETFs. an ETF is a, similar to a, a managed fund. Uh, well, typically an ETF and how they're commonly known as is is really like an index type strategy, a very passive form of investing. And really, ETFs grew from the perspective that well, a lot of fund managers actually don't beat the benchmark. And when I say benchmark, I'm talking about say the ASX 200, for example. And mathematically. You can't have all fund managers beating the benchmark, particularly when they're charging a fee. So they've not only got to beat the benchmark, they've got to beat the benchmark plus their fee. And mathematically, it's impossible for all of them to to beat that benchmark. And, and that's really where a chap by the name of Jack Bogle pioneered index investing, saying, well, you know, there's all these fund managers out there charging a fee. Uh, most of them don't beat the benchmark. Well, why don't we just invest in the benchmark? And that's really where index investing came from and and how a lot of exchange-traded funds were created to just buy the index. And that's known as passive investing. So there's no one actually um, choosing the stocks. They're just buying the stocks in the benchmark and uh, a mathematical algorithm is adjusting that every day. And interestingly, most uh, activity in in share markets these days is all done by algorithms and it's algorithms off the back of exchange traded funds, just mathematically investing money, algorithms that are being put together by fund managers to try and come up with a mathematical way of of, of beating the market. And the US, in the US now, it's about 60 or 70% of all trades that go through the US market is based on this algorithmic or mathematical um, type of uh, investing. So it's leaving it up to the computers to to do all the the management of the funds. Yeah, look, that's right. And over the the last decade, um, a lot of money has gone from the managed funds, the active managers that are stock picking, over to the exchange-traded funds where it's just run by an algorithm and people are are buying an index. 
and that in itself has has issues from a, from a market perspective. But that's been the real the real trend because that's uh, going to have a big influence on how the market moves. Look, it does, and it's a little bit unknown territory as you look forward. If you start to get to a certain percentage of the market that is dominated by these algorithms and these exchange traded funds, oh, how does a market react in a time of of panic when the, all the algorithms kick in and uh, dips get um, amplified? Amplified, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how that's that will develop. Mm. Um, and it really goes against the sort of whole idea of a of a market, which is about people allocating capital to the best companies that are going to you know, make the best use of that money. So it has its issues, definitely. Okay, so exploring the exchange traded fund, say one that um, invests in the ASX two hundred only. The ASX two hundred is not set in stone; it's changing all the time. Some companies are coming in, some companies are going out, and the I don't want to use the word weighting, but the proportion that each company occupies of that ASX 200 changes. So is that what an ETF is doing, is managing that? Well, that's exactly right. It's it's structured based on the size of each company. So, you know, if your biggest company in the index is, is CBA, Commonwealth Bank, then your exchange traded fund is that is going to be the biggest holding in it. And it's interesting, you know, the bigger that these companies get, bigger the proportion of the index that they occupy and the exchange traded funds have to buy more of it. We've seen this extreme example in the United States where it's the tech companies these days, um, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, known as the FANG stocks, have become so big and take a big proportion of the index, it, it, it creates a concentration. Um, so the bigger they get, more capital goes in, which is kind of fundamentally flawed. You shouldn't be putting more capital into something just because it's bigger. So there are other ways of structuring an index and there are other exchange traded funds that, that look for a little bit more of a creative way of, of, of allocating that. But broadly speaking, an index will be structured based on the biggest company to the smallest company in, the, in that. And then it's rebalanced over certain periods of time to reflect the changes in the, uh, in the size of the underlying companies. So ETFs can be very creative in the way that they invest as well. I mean, I've, I know of one, what, I think it's called Bear, yep. that will you can profit from, from the market going down. Absolutely. How does that work? So you're really getting into the space of uh, derivatives, and derivatives are a really complex area, and it's a podcast in, its, in itself. But there are strategies out there that will use – a, a derivative which is put together by an institution that you can actually bet on the market going down instead of it going up. And there are many different permutations of derivatives over specific shares, over index, and really complex financial engineering, which is used by fund managers and, and, and hedge funds. But you can absolutely access um, exchange traded funds to like the one you mentioned, bear to actually bet on the market going down, like you can on buying exchange traded funds that will just invest with the market going up. You can also buy exchange traded funds that also have a specific mathematical strategy, exchange traded funds that have a slightly different makeup of, of the index and exchange traded funds that access different markets around the world. So it's a really Really cool way of- A smorgasbord. Yeah, of, of accessing uh, different types of markets and different types of, of strategies, and, and they generally come at a, at a fairly low cost. So there's a plethora of choice out there. Options are a kind of derivative, and these are derived from the underlying value of a share. How do you make money out of an option? There's two kinds of options. Look, options, you can buy and sell option contracts over many different types of assets. It's it's done over shares and indexes. The two types of options are call options or put options. Now, a call option is when you are buying an option today on the expectation that the price is going to be higher in the future and you set that price. Uh, and conversely, a put option is something that you buy and it gives you the option to sell at a future date on the expectation that the price is going to be lower. Now, the thing about options is um, they are contracts and they are contracts over a set period of time. And so once you get to that time 
point of when an option will, um, will, will mature, then it can be in the money or out of the money. And if it's out of the money, you've done your dough in terms of what you paid for that initial option. If it's in the money, then it's really the difference that, um, between the, uh, the price you can uh, buy or sell at and the, and the, and the strike price of the, of the option. Okay, and um, uh, we're threatening to do the Greeks at any time now it's, too. It's uh, that's very, 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 very complex. Yeah, yeah. And the other, the other, obviously, the other um, uh, derivative out there is that's widely used are, are futures contracts. Yeah, and CFDs and warrants. There's a whole range of. Uh, look, I think yeah. if you're talking about uh, introducing the share market for for beginners, it's important to understand the the different platforms out there that people can access the share market. Traditionally, it's going through a, a broker where you buy the actual share in the company. Um, but there are other ways to access the share market through contracts for difference. Um, and it's really important to understand what those are because you can put a very small amount of money on um, to get exposure to a stock. But essentially, it's highly leveraged and it does expose the investor to losing a lot more money from a very, very small position. Um, so it's important to understand exactly how you're accessing the market and being aware of the risks. Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorised reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Tired of ads interrupting your gripping investigations? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Ads shouldn't be the scariest thing about true crime. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free true crime to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads.